The last time we saw each other was in the trenches of a war during a tour of duty where we'd seen some shit. There's so many things I feel like I'm gonna regret after you leave and when you spend time in the editing bay because right now I feel like, oh, okay, this is a really good choice of what I'm doing. However, right afterwards, I think I'm gonna regret everything I've said. Okay. I'm just pumping my bog. The bathroom's always clean. You can eat in there if you want to. Huh. Hey guys, look, it's Kevin McGee, and he's a storyteller. He's won the moth like multiple times. What first got you into storytelling? I had a big story. I didn't know how to do it. And I didn't want to be that guy who went up there and said, do you want to see my one-man show about when this horrible event happened? Right. I lived with my mother for her final five months. Yeah. And during that time period, we made a conscious decision that we were not going to let the inevitability and the depression of this whole thing beat us. Right. We decided we were going to lean into it and we are going to embrace your situation. We are going to make it the best of every moment as we live together for the final five months. And what we did was we decided to plan this party, uh, an end of her life celebration where we invited people from all through her life to come to celebrate her for one final time. And then it was this beautiful event and then eight days later she died. At the end of this, I needed to tell the story, but I didn't want to be the guy, do you want to see my one man show about what my mom died? I kind of just let it be. But then I saw a comedian named Mike Birbiglia tell his story Sleepwalk With Me which was the first time I had ever seen someone talk about a very serious issue, which was a medical condition, about his sleepwalking condition, and was able to make it into a comedy show that had a full narrative arc. And at the end of it, that was my first thought of, are you kidding me? That's exactly what I want to do, which is you can make something very funny, even though it is a very real human emotional piece. When did you start writing that first story? It was 2007, and This American Life did a thing where they simulcast one of a live, show mm -hmm. in movie theaters around the country. I uh, sat in the theater and I saw Mike Birbiglia tell the story when he was T-boned in a car that eventually came became his second special on uh, My Girlfriend's Boyfriend. And when I saw him tell that, I had this moment of, this is exactly what I want to do. I thought he was the coolest thing and I thought he had pulled off exactly what I'd always wanted to pull off. Finally, tell my story about my mother and that whole party and it's very funny, at the same time, Ruben, it just it's heartbreaking at the same time. Yeah. I tell it for uh, a one-man show, and then I tell it for the moth. The moth picks me up, and the reason I even started telling it the moth is because I went and did research. This is the first time he ever told the story was at the moth. So I thought I'm going to follow his exact same trajectory. I tell the story for the moth. I do it in a Grand Slam final competition. I do not win. However, the producers of the moth in New York see it. They contact me and say, will you be on our main stage program where we will, we will take you around the country telling the story and eventually you could end up on the podcast. This is the exact same trajectory as Mike Birbiglia. So I followed that and I was so excited. And then on the day that I was going to the biggest thing I'd ever done, which was going to Austin, Texas to perform at the something theater. Yeah. Which, uh, there were 1,200 people in attendance to see the story. Now, on the way there, it's 7.30 in the morning in LAX. Who do I pass as I go to my gate in Austin, Texas? I pass Mike Birbiglia at 7 in the morning as he's going to another gate. And it was one of those cool moments where, oh my God, I wish I could stop him and say it, but I don't want to be that guy yeah. who stops him and says, I watched your, pro right. I watched your program and it totally Jake inspired Bala. me. We cut ahead yeah. uh, two years. And uh, he is going to see his friend, Jeff Garland, is doing, uh, he's working on his new one-man show, and Mike Birbiglia comes to see it and give notes on it. And it's at the theater that I teach. One of my best friends and fellow teachers calls me and says, Mike Birbiglia's in the building, get down here. And Jeff starts to rail on my friend for, why are you texting during my show? I'm not able to make it that night, but it becomes to me the second thing that I would tell Mike Birbiglia when we ever meet. Do you remember when you were seeing Jeff Garland's show, the guy who got in trouble for texting? Right. He was texting, texting me you. to say you were here. We have two awesome stories to tell. Now, I worked at Second City for a tremendous amount of time in Chicago, and uh, an old friend of mine is Keegan Michael Key. Yes. And when Keegan Michael Key he came to Second City Hollywood one night, I told him the story that I just told you in the airport, so Mike Birbiglia, he had, who had just finished filming Don't Think Twice, said to me, <laughs> I just finished shooting a movie with Mike Birbiglia, and I would love to tell him this story. Send me everything you just said to me, and I will send it to him the next day. Keegan sent it back, 
And I never heard back from Mike Birbiglia. On well, his defense, he had to edit the movie. Don't don't think don't think twice. Yeah. Don't think for game. However, when the movie premiered, I bought a ticket where it was the entire cast speaking about the movie. Yes. On the day of, I wrote my old friend Keegan Michael Key and yeah. said, "Hey man, I'm going to be there tonight." Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Find me when you get there. Yes. And I'll let you meet everybody. The moment. So I watched the movie. And afterwards, they do the Q and A with the entire cast, and then in the emergency exit in all movie theaters, that's where all the cast goes right afterwards. And then I see Keegan looking for me. Oh my God, Kevin! Now I am talking to him, and three feet away from me is Mike Birbiglia, yes. the guy I've wanted to meet for so long. As I'm talking to Keegan, with Mike Birbiglia three feet away from me, he decides to wax nostalgic and to get really emotional with me, where he says, "Isn't that great?" This movie depicts everything. So we start talking about it. We start talking about our past. We start sharing stories, and I keep on the peripheral, looking over at Mike Birbiglia, and then Keegan, who is the coolest guy and has not changed from when I knew him to now being superstar. My buddy Jeff is standing right there, and Jeff and、uh, Keegan goes over to him and says, "Hi, I'm Keegan." So then the two of them start talking, and then I make my way over to Mike Birbiglia, and then. Also in the cast is a woman named Tammy Sager, who I've known as long as I've known Keegan, and she sees me and goes, "Oh my God, Kevin, this is our lives, isn't it?" And we start talking about it. I still see Mike Birbiglia, but Tammy and I finish talking. I go back to Keegan to say, "Hey, I'd like to meet Mike Birbiglia." And right at that moment, the theater owner says, "No, no, we got to go to the next Q and A. You guys ready?" And then Mike Birbiglia goes over to him and then leaves, and I miss my other opportunity to finally meet him. No, really? Yes. But the only thing I can think that makes it better is it only makes the story better when I do eventually get to meet him. Oh my God, Kevin McGeehan! So close. So close. Oh.、Uh-huh. But if nothing else, it was really cool just to keep building the story, and I love、oh、the fact、God. that keep building it. Keep building it.